that man is a dev worshiper that man is bad that you know actually everyone uh, the whole community picture yourself as a lady getting ready to get married your family warns you that the man you're about to marry is a very bad person and they believe he is a devil they say he behaves very badly and isn't suitable for anyone to be with despite their warnings would you still go ahead with the marriage this woman faced rejection from her family and friends who believed she married someone with devil-like qualities. Why does her family treat her husband that way? Is there any truth to the accusations against him? However, as you hear their story, you'll be surprised at how they transformed into the kind of family that everyone would want to have. My name is Emily Migogo. I'm a mother of two and a wife. To a man who is older than me, by far, actually, by very many years. And when I met him, I was a young girl in the university, and he was a grown-up man, living his life, having finished school for a long, no, no, actually been expelled from school a long time ago. As a grown-up, Emily used to meet different people. And on this one day, she met a man whom her family didn't like at all. They called him names and didn't approve of him. It was the first time she had met someone her family felt so strongly negatively about. So the first day that we met, and I'm passing, and then this guy calls me. So I go to the guy because I know him. And then he tells me, it's not me calling you, it's this guy. So I looked at the guy who was calling me. I was like, what? A guy with the rasta. He was very brown. You know, he had just landed from London, so he looks very brown. I don't know why people from there are brown. He looked at some. According to me, he was like, hmm, this guy is hot. Okay. <laughs> Remember, I'm in the university, so I'm not scared of people. So I sit there and he's like, get a drink. And I asked for my personal eyes. He was like, I thought she was a small girl. She drinks. So actually, it was a very hot day. So I took my two taskers and then exchanged numbers and mm -hmm. left. I thought it was handsome, actually. Oh, nice, yeah, I thought nice. he looked cute. Mm -hmm. he, they were in a group of five men and I think he was the cutest. That's when they began to form a strong connection and it marked the beginning of a challenging time filled with hearing harsh and negative words about this man. The first person to know about it was my mom from my family and she was, not, actually not my mom, an employee of my mom because we had an hotel and I came back when I met him that day I met him and I told that girl do you know so and so do you know Rastuma I met him today and he told me like he would like to see me again and she was like what that man is a devil worshiper actually he's a self proclaimed devil worshiper he worships lions I think it's because of the lion of Judah stuff on the Rasta clothes or something so scared. Remember, I am a young university student. A person who worships the devil. I was like, he had given me 200 to go to Nairobi to meet him the following day, which was on a Wednesday, I remember very well. And she told me, please go and give, give him back the 200 shillings. Okay. So I started looking for him where I'd found him in our restaurant to give him back his 200 shillings. <laughs> Apparently, I did not find him. He had only, uh, already left. Mm -hmm. And I went home with my 200 shillings and I was scared. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was not going to Nairobi on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So it is Wednesday and it is in the evening. I have not gone to Nairobi. I still have the dev worshippers 200 shillings. Mm -hmm. So I did my phone, uh, my phone had a problem. So I borrowed a phone from someone, an old man somewhere. Please give me your phone. That time there was a problem of network, but I found a place I could call him. I told him, I'm not coming to Nairobi. I've been held up. He was like, it's okay. Okay, so I put my 200 in the pocket. That was it. Then I met him earlier, uh, later, like after one week, and we started talking. Yeah, we decided to give it a try. And so we, we became uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend, or girlfriend and man friend, something like that. Because my uncle is an old man. During this period, Emily started to feel like things were back to normal. A unique relationship began, but it came with a significant challenge, dealing with the negative words her family was throwing at her. 
But Emily's husband has a theory about why many people see him as a bad person. He believes it's because of his Rasta mentality. He even shares an example of some situations where some people mistreated him because of it. So my first move was, anyway, first of all, I was chased from school. That's labor. That's a labor. Because of my way of last, I think, I was chased from school uh, forever. Mm -hmm. For G. So. That was the reason. Mm, there was so many reasons because I was punished because of. I was given. Okay, anyway, we started. We made a noise in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I was in Form 3. We made noise. Like, we were 11 of us. And I was selected to be killed only me. And the rest were torn to cut grasses. So I refused. And when I refused, the teacher. The discipline teacher just kicked me with blows and kicks and just killing me. Then I went banana and I took rocks and I started throwing the classrooms and staff rooms and kitchen and you know fighting the school. So I was chased by everybody from school. Even the cook, the cleaner, the students, my friends, they all chased me. So I left my everything. It was a boarding school. It was a boarding school, oh, yeah, three. secondary school. Oh. From three, it was three. far away from here. Mm. So anyway, I was chased and I never went back there. Mm. I've never stepped there again from that day. So when I came home, my dad had already retired and he told me he don't want to see me out there. If I refused to go to school, if I've stopped learning to leave his compound. Mm. So I stayed for a few months, then I went to Mombasa. Mm. So when I went to Mombasa, because of I, I didn't do my Form 4 exams, so nobody could have employed me. Mm. The only job I could get was to work in a kibana, which is a kiosk, mm. uh, which was like 1,000, 2,000 shillings a month. Mm. So I, did, I couldn't take that. So I joined a group of Juakaris. They make jikos. So that's when I went there, then I became a professional Juakaris, and that's why I'm called as Chuma. Oh, that's where Chuma came that's from. That's where the Chuma oh came from. <laughs> didn't come from my mother. My mother didn't know, didn't know why they're calling me Chuma. Even now, she don't know. Oh. Uh, the people calling me Chuma all over. all over. This time, of course, he started to live a difficult life, where he met with bad things, and people considered him as a bad person, especially if a person is a Rasta with dreadlocks on his head. The surprising twist to the story is this Rasta man, who was labeled as a devil, was a very humble man. Not only that, he was well off, thanks to some successful activities he was involved in because he was a man who knew how to work hard. He even spent a considerable amount of time living in London. They kept on going for a long time, but in challenging times, years later the man made a proposal which wasn't easy for Emily because of her family's way of thinking. So we quoted for very many years almost 10 and that time I was living in London most of the time so when he started living in Kenya most of the time then he told me that he would like to marry me so how do I tell my parents that the, this man this man who, who they have been fighting all along for all those 10 years because they had been fighting him seriously tell us the fights oh my you, god my mom was the worst she was like who are you dating that man is a known thug that man did not finish school. You are a university student. That man is uh, a robber. That man is a devil worshiper. That man is bad. That you know, actually everyone, uh, the whole community, the whole community. I went and told mom, uh, this guy has told me that he wants to marry me when he comes back. She told me, what? You want to marry the toughest person in Ishiara? Just imagine a scenario where you guys fall out. Who will ever want you? Who will want to marry somebody who had been married by the cruelest man in the community? And that hit me. I've actually, I've never forgotten those words. Who wants to? You want to marry the cruelest man in the community? If In case you fall out and he leaves you, who will marry you? Everybody fears him. Everybody is scared of him. Okay, 
So that was from my mom. That's why. I, actually, she, she used the word dog. You want to marry a dog? A dog. Um, okay. Apart from her, even my other family members were against it. My grandmother was alive that time. And she was also against it. Like, don't marry that man. You're a learned girl. You are a person with a job. You even have a car. Why do you want to marry this kind of a man? What is it? He's even very much older than you. So it was two months of beating myself right, left, and center. Do I? Do I not? Do I? Do I not? So the guy is calling me every day. When I come back, I'm marrying you. He didn't know what I was going through. A lot of girls go through a similar struggle, and unfortunately, some don't succeed. Emily's story serves as a strong example of how our families can strongly influence us, sometimes pushing us in directions that may not be best for us. Despite this, it's crucial to recognize our own abilities to understand ourselves and make decisions that align with our true selves. Uh, so he comes back and I've made up my mind. I'm going to marry him. And that's what happened. So you mean you did not tell him what is happening to you? Okay, later when you got married. But in the process you didn't? I didn't. No. I told him that he had been told all sort of things like he's oh, too old, he's a dog, he's cruel, he's basically so many bad things. But I was love. I was in love. I was smitten. There was no way whatever they were telling me could get into my ears. Yeah. Okay. Their marriage and living together were filled with challenges, making everything quite difficult. Challenges came from various directions, and amid all of this, Emily continued to confront a variety of challenges, not just within her own family, but also in her husband's family. I stuck for like six months before getting the baby. And so one day, I remember one day, the mom came, the mother, my mother-in-law now. She came, the, we had a problem, me and my husband. And she was like, what will people say? Do you know people out there say that you married a barren woman? What? You know, I'd finished university like um, four years back. And I'd stayed working for another four years. So according to the community, that's a very old person. Somebody who is working and she has no child. Mm. So I think that period that I'd stayed without getting a baby, people thought I'm barren. Mm. So she told us on our faces that you people say that you married a barren woman. You know, those words hit me because actually I was pregnant my first month of pregnancy. And now here is my mother-in-law, his mother, saying that uh, people say you married a barren woman. Anyway, we continued and we got our baby. So whoever had been saying that I was barren, I think they were ashamed. And our baby grew. We got our second one uh, five years later. Four years, five years later. And we have two lovely babies. And whoever that had been saying bad things about us, I think we shamed them. In the beginning, many doubted that they could make it, but despite the challenges, they turned into a happy and strong family. Now they have two adorable children, a daughter and a son. Their journey together began with a lot of negativity and criticism, but looking at them today, it's hard to believe that they are the same couple who overcame those obstacles and created the joyous family they are now. Come here, come here, come here. You're just around the corner. This is my... The baby girl, Mimi, this one, and she's in school in Nairobi. She's standing in Nairobi. Okay. Happy Road School in Burburu. Yes, very expensive school. You mean your, your body? Yes. Ooh. She's a junior secondary. Okay. She's going to class now. She's going to class eight. Okay, thank and you. the other one is called Prince Chuma. Come here, Chuma boy. Rasta. <laughs> quick, quick, Rasta boy. Right. Yeah, this one is another one. The other one is with. Seven years? How old are you now, my son? I'm going eight. You are going eight years. Okay. And which class are you going now? Grade three. 
your boyfriend Dre and which school are you? Ten Dre. You are in Ten Dre Primary School. Wow. Yes, and that's <laughs> they can permit Rasta Rasta in school, so that's why I took him there in in Embu. Okay. That's why he go to school, okay. not here. Oh, here they can't take. No, okay. no, I have another house in Embu for oh. because of him. Okay. So I go there now and then because of because of his education. Thank you very much. Yes. Wow. But it's truly astonishing how things can turn around when people realize they were mistaken about something. Initially, they might have been the ones discouraging you, but as they see the positive changes in growth, they often shift to tell you that you were right. It's a remarkable transformation when those who were once doubtful become your biggest cheerleaders. I hear some young ladies say, Ah, I want to have no problem. I want to marry someone old like you. I want to have my own, uh, my Rasta. They say my Rasta. I'm also, I am also looking for my Rasta. So it became like I'm um, same old, like I want to have my Rasta, meaning someone old, yes. someone much older. Like it's all right, it's we comfortable. Our, our role model yeah, kind of. Yeah, we became role models. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so Rasta. someone young can marry somebody old, and it's all right, and they can have a family, and they prosper and do stuff. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. This man is really amazing, even though some people label him as bad. In reality, he's a great guy with values that are completely opposite to what they've been saying about him. Emily herself acknowledges that she sees him as a wonderful husband, quite different from what her family thought. And also, uh, I have a master's degree which I owe to him because he's the one who took me back to, his, to school, to the university, when I was pregnant with my second baby. And I graduated with my with my baby and my master's degree. So I think he's a good man who values education. He told me because I did not get get education, I'll get it through you. And that's how he took me back to school. So he, so he has masters. Yes. And he's not going to Actually, school. I told him when I was graduating, this is yours. This, this, is, this is not my degree. This, this is, is yours. Your yes. And so we after after sometimes we started um, a production company. Uh -huh. It's called Emmy Chuma. I'm Emmy. He's Chuma. It's called Emmy Chuma Productions. Mm. So we do movies. We do uh, creative con uh, content. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, we yeah. do. We create content. Mm -hmm. So we have movies in TVs like UTV, Mwendani TV, um, Meru TV. Okay. Yeah, we do movies. We do series, and uh, our children are models. Kids model. Uh, kid models. So we do a lot. On Facebook, um, I am Emmy Actress and he's Ras Chumal. So if you go to Facebook, you'll find me Emmy Actress. You go to TikTok, you'll find me Emmy Actress, E-M-I Actress, Emmy Actress. YouTube also, it's called um, UTV, uh, UTV what? Emmy Wasoko. Because our series in, in UTV is called Emmy Wasoko. This serves as a valuable lesson for everyone, showing that people's perceptions of others often differ from reality. Emily's story is a clear illustration of how negative words can be directed at someone based on personal emotions rather than the true nature of the person. It reminds us to look beyond hearsay and judgments and take the time to understand individuals for who they genuinely are. Guys out there, do not run away from love. Even if you run away from love, because I tried running away actually from love, I ran very fast, but it followed me wherever I went. So even if you fall in love, you fall in, uh, you run away from love, it will follow you. And please, if you want to get married, marry your best friend because Rastuma is my best friend. Marry your best friend. If you do not marry your best friend, you will have problems. Even if you want to go away, you will go because you you are not with your best friend. But the moment you're with your best friend, even if love gets lost, you still have your friendship, and you'll still be together. Marry your best friend. And it is possible to find love even from somebody who is much, much older than you are. Love knows no age. Let this resonate as a testament to the strength of love, the ability to overcome challenges, and the importance of forming our opinions based on genuine understanding rather than hearsay. Emily's journey, marked by resilience and growth, encourages us all to embrace the diversity of stories that unfold in unexpected ways, showing that happiness and fulfillment can emerge from the unlikeliest of beginnings. Thanks for watching. I am Jordan Sullivan.
and this is Aframax English. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss any of our stories.